All right. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is William Sia. I'm currently a senior at Ledoux Horton Watkins High School. Um, the previous lecture I gave in terms of the series of lectures on policy debate uh, was about topicality, and today I'm going to touch a bit on theory. So, if you'll remember from last time, my lecture was titled Topicality, an Introduction to the Rules of the Game, and theory is more of an extension of topicality. It's a broader uh, concept, which is why this is titled Theory, the Rules of the Game. So we'll get more in-depth into ideas like how debate is a game. So, uh, let's review. What makes debate a game? So we have win conditions. So just like last time, we talked about disadvantages, uh, the case. Uh, we have case turns, inherency, and solvency. And then obviously, uh, there's the addition of topicality, which is a win condition for the negative team. And then we also have rules. Um, so once again, we have order of speeches, which is set. Uh, set amount of speech, prep, and cross-ex time. And then also what types of arguments each side can run. So in terms of the rules of the game, we're going to be diving a lot more into uh, what arguments each side can run. So whereas topicality is sort of a restriction on the types of plans an affirmative team can run, theory is sort of an argument that says, here are the types of arguments that either side should be able to run. So we have arguments like topicality, not just for the resolution, but also for many different things within policy debate itself, and we'll sort of dive into some of the uh, main things that you might encounter uh, throughout, your, uh, throughout your debate career. Um, once again, I'd like to reiterate that this type of debate as a game model uh, sort of only applies to the most flow of judges because uh, they have this debate experience and they'll know what you're talking about if you try and present debate as like a game when you're talking about theory or topicality. So... <clears throat> I already went over a little bit about what theory is, but let's take a look at what the structure of theory actually is. So you'll notice that it's quite similar to how topicality is structured. We always start with an interpretation. Uh, for topicality, that usually involves defining a word in the resolution um, and interpreting that word. Um, theory is broader than that. It's saying uh, you have an interpretation that says this is your model of debate. So if we think about the parallels between theory and topicality, it's actually quite easy to see um, because topicality, when we're defining a word in the resolution, we're basically uh, also presenting our own model of debate. We're saying the affirmative team should present a plan within the debate uh, that pertains to this specific interpretation of a word. So we're interpreting the resolution and as a result, uh, creating a model of debate, uh, more specifically about what this word means. Theory is more general. We're talking about what type of argument should be legitimate in debate or what types of arguments shouldn't be legitimate in debate. Uh, so we're still defining a rule that we think should be implemented uh, in policy debate. So then the second part, very similar to topicality, violation, how the other team doesn't meet your interpretation. So for topicality, how they don't meet the interpretation of your word. Uh, for theory, how the other team is doing something that breaks the rule that you're proposing. Um, then we have standards, um, same as topicality, reasons why the violation would be bad for debate. And then finally, impacts and voters, uh, which just like topicality are usually just fairness and education. So let's take a closer look at standards. So when we talked about topicality, we talked about some of the standards like limits, ground, precision, framers intent, bright line, predictability. Uh, some of these can be applicable to theory and a lot of these are actually really specific to topicality. So something like framers intent, when it comes to like writing a resolution and defining the resolution. That's something that only has to do with defining words in the resolution. So we can't really apply that to theory, uh, but we can apply that to topicality. But you'll notice that there are a lot of standards in theory which are uh, very similar to topicality, but obviously the list that I have here for theory standards is very small and very brief. These are just some of the most common standards you might encounter, but there are a lot of standards, um, and we'll talk, get into more about how flexible theory arguments really are, uh, especially in the debate space. So you'll notice there's some parallels here, like limits, uh, ground, um, and predictability, all of those still apply when we're, when we, when we're talking about theory arguments, um, and because those are really talking about objectively debate itself and what debate should actually look like, um, as opposed to a definition or like the merits of a definition. So let's talk about specific types of theory. So one of the most common places you'll find theory arguments being read is counterplans. So 
there's this thing called conditionality. I'm sure that uh, in his previous lecture, Gabe talked a lot about conditionality. Um, most of the time, negative teams who run counterplans will say it's conditional, which means that they can kick the counterplan like an advantage uh, at any time they want to. So there are a lot of theory arguments about conditionality, and here are some of the common interpretations. So for an affirmative team, they might say you should only be able to run one conditional counterplan. So they can only run one counterplan um, and they get the ability to kick it whenever they want. Uh, the negative team might argue we get many conditional counterplans. So maybe a team decides they want to read 10 different conditional counterplans um, and then decide to pick the one that the 2AC drops uh, in the 2AC. And then they go with that in the negative block. Um, maybe the affirmative team says the negative team should only run unconditional counterplans, or they shouldn't be allowed to kick their counterplan. They have to extend it into the 2NR. Or maybe they say we should have a dispositional interpretation where uh, the negative team has to meet certain conditions in order to actually be able to kick the counterplan. Um, so a couple of standards that are associated with this idea of conditionality, uh, multiple worlds versus flexibility, contradictory arguments versus multiple advocacies, reciprocity versus structural unfairness, time skew, depth versus breadth, and clash. So getting into these actual standards, so first, it's important to think about um, where do these standards originate from? So conditionality is the idea that the negative team can run, um, say, five different counterplans, kick any of them whenever they feel like it. Um, so the multiple worlds, well, if we have five different counterplans, you're advocating for five different worlds as opposed to the affirmative plan, which is only advocating for one. Um, and maybe the affirmative team says that's bad because considering multiple worlds um, is bad for debate because now we're squirreling around in five different worlds instead of having a debate about two different worlds and going into the nitty gritty on those worlds. Whereas the negative team might say flexibility is good. Uh, debate is structurally unfair. The affirmative team gets the first and last speech. Therefore, if the negative team has the ability to be flexible in their argumentation, uh, it'll make debate more fair. Um, and then for contradictory arguments, sometimes uh, negative teams will have more than one conditional advocacy. They might run um, a capitalism counterplan and uh, a capitalism critique, and they might also read um, like an like an econ disadvantage. So that's a contradictory argument. So with conditional counterplans, um, oftentimes we get two different philosophies when it comes to our advocacy. So maybe a capitalism critique and a space colonization counterplan that says let's fund uh, space exploration. Those are inherently contradictory and the affirmative team might argue contradiction is bad for debate because then suddenly the negative team can just read whatever they want um, without having concern about sounding credible. Um, the next thing, reciprocity for structural unfairness. So reciprocity is the idea that both the affirmative team and negative team should have equal um, responsibilities and equal capabilities. So if the uh, affirmative team is allowed to kick out of only advantages and they can't kick parts of their plan, uh, the negative team shouldn't be allowed to kick out parts of their counter advocacy or their counter plans, um, but they should be allowed to kick disadvantages, for example. Reciprocity. Um, the counter argument might be structural unfairness. So debate is inherently structured to not have reciprocity. Affirmative gets infinite prep, first and last speech, negative gets the block. Those are two things which neither team, uh, which the other team doesn't have. So structurally, debate isn't reciprocal. So maybe negative says that. Um, time skew is an argument. Uh, it's basically saying that you're only reading this many counter plans uh, and you're planning to kick out of most of them just so that you can waste the affirmative team's time and so that debate isn't really about each of the counter plans. Um, it's really just you're reading these so that we can wait so that you're making us waste time, say, in the 2AC or the 1AR. Depth versus breadth. This is an idea from the topicality lecture. Basically, is having a debate about one subject, but a really deep and detailed oriented debate. Is that better for education and fairness? Uh, or is breadth where we have a debate about many things uh, and we look at many things, maybe not as deeply, um, but we look at many different things. And is that better for education or for fairness? The final thing on this is clash. And clash is the idea that um, debate uh, is only fair or only educational if the two sides can actually engage. Um, if you If you imagine like one team decides they want to read their affirmative plan, then the negative team comes up here and reads topicality, uh, some disadvantages, and a counter plan. And then the affirmative team in the 2AC 
ignores all of it and just continues reading stuff about their affirmative plan, and then the negative team doesn't capitalize, and they just continue reading stuff about topicality, well, then you have basically two ships sailing in the night. Uh, none of these... None of the two teams are engaging with each other. There's no interaction in the debate. Um, and subsequently, you could argue that makes for a bad debate because not only are we not having debates about like evidence quality or the real details of reality or something like that, um, but also it makes debate unfair in a way because um, then neither team has to engage with one another. So <clears throat> the other thing, the, the next thing about counterplans is permutations. So one of the arguments we have is like perm do both. Uh, and there's a couple of different interpretations. The two main ones is severance perms bad and intrinsic perms bad. So um, I'm sure Gabe talked about in his lecture that what a severance perm is and what an intrinsic perm is. So just to uh, reiterate, severance perms are basically where the affirmative team says, let's do the plan and the counter plan, but they decide to cut out part of the plan when they make this permutation. So that's a severance perm. An intrinsic perm would be like, let's do the plan and the counter plan and then something else that isn't an either. So that's an intrinsic perm. Typically, we think these are bad in debate. Um, and the reason why is for these three main standards. So if you think about why these standards are bad. First, moving target. If the affirmative team is allowed to cut out any part of their plan or add in stuff that's never been introduced to the debate um, just for the perm, uh, that sort of makes them a moving target. Suddenly their advocacy is changing and it's not only about the plan or the counter plan and it's not a test of competition. It's just saying the affirmative team is now suddenly shifting what their plan does just so that they can perm the counter plan. Uh, there's reciprocity. So once again, this idea of the affirmative team shouldn't be allowed to cut out of parts of their plan or add in parts of their plan, just like the negative team. If they're running a counter plan, say you're running one off counter plan, uh, you're not going to cut out parts of your counter plan. Um, so there's the idea of reciprocity there. Uh, and then finally, there's predictability, um, especially with intrinsic perms. Um, you can argue predictability because like, if the affirmative team is adding some element to their plan that neither team introduced, well, then the negative team can't predict that because the affirmative team is introducing something new that's outside of the scope of the topic, um, something that we, they probably wouldn't prepare for. Uh, the final theory argument we'll talk about is types of counterplans. So there are a multitude of different arguments. So we have consult counterplans, good or bad, delay counterplans, good or bad, process counterplans, good or bad, picks, good or bad, functional and textual competition. Um, and some standards you might have is like debating yourself, especially when it comes to plan inclusive counterplans. Uh, the affirmative team is now just debating their own plan, but minus one tiny thing. Not really interesting, or maybe that's bad because making the affirmative team debate themselves uh, might be bad because it means the negative team gets to shirk on actual argumentation. They don't run generics. They're just running this one counter plan, uh, which cuts out of a tiny part, and it's basically debating yourself, and that could be good or bad. Uh, we have real-worldness, so sometimes, uh, for example, a delay counter plan, um, the negative team might argue these things are good. Because in real policy making, uh, we always consider the context of things, and delaying things is something that congressmen of often do if maybe the political situation isn't right, or there's some complication with like international relations that makes this plan a bad idea now, but still a good idea down the road. Um, and finally, there's topic education, um, and this is the idea that uh, the debate, especially for plan-inclusive counterplans, suddenly isn't really about the merits of a plan. Uh, that the affirmative team proposes, it's about the merits of a tiny little thing within their plan, which may not necessarily relate to uh, this year's topic, criminal, criminal justice reform. So next, let's talk about fiat theory. So we should be familiar with the idea of fiat, or the idea that the affirmative uh, team and the negative team who reserves the right to fiat, they can uh, wor wor not worry about the complications of passing the plan itself. Um, which is a very blanket definition of fiat and de definitely oversimplified, but that's basically what it says. So first we should talk about durable fiat. So durable fiat is this idea that once you pass the plan, it'll stay in place for a long time, long enough that we can see some of the impacts that the affirmative or the negative team might be talking about when they're fiating this action. 
Um, and this is important because if we could just make the argument, oh, your plan's going to get circumvented as soon as it gets passed, or oh, your plan's going to get repealed as soon as it gets passed, well then, it sort of trivializes the whole impact debate. Uh, it's like, well, we can't run any advantages because our plan's just going to get repealed. That's no fun. Um, so that's the idea of durable fiat. Teams may argue it's good or bad. Typically, we argue it's good. I think you'll encounter that more. And the reasons why is because the standards for this, which I've listed here, are just much more uh, strong when it comes to durable fiat good. So like necessary for impacts, right? If we just repeal the plan every single time it gets passed after you vote F, well then what's the point of debating impacts? Uh, there's limits. Um, if we just repeal the plan every time and negative makes the same argument every time, like the current president isn't going to isn't going to agree with the plan, so he'll, rep he'll repeal it, um, well then that's not really good for limits because the negative isn't really exploring anything, and the affirmative basically has nothing to run, because if the entire resolution is a progressive resolution when we have a Republican or conservative president, uh, then the affirmative basically has nothing they can run that actually works. Real world. Um, this is an argument for durable fiat bad. Um, they might The negative team, usually, might argue that durable fiat is bad, because we need to consider uh, how policymaking works IRL. We can't just say fiat, and go past all of these real-world consequences. Um, and then finally, there's topic education, and this sort of ties into the whole necessary for impacts thing. Even if we talk about how good a proposal is, um, and say it gets passed, if it just gets repealed afterwards, um, and they can just make the argument none of the impacts happen, uh, we sort of lose out on that topic education part, where we sort of explore the impacts of, say, the prison system, like in this year, or arms sales to Taiwan, like last year. Uh, so topic education is a really important one. Uh, the other fiat-related argument we'll talk about is actor fiat. So this year you might really see 50 state fiat bad. Uh, you run a state's counter plan um, and you run a federalism disad, and they decide the uh, the affirmative team decides let's read 50 state fiat bad. Um, in K debates you might have utopian fiat bad. Oftentimes in Ks we have really out there alt like alts. For example, capitalism might be uh, a a communist revolution. That's not really likely, but they can say fiat and suddenly it happens or they're advocating for it. Or international fiat. So this is more of an issue with international topics or on the topic two years ago, which was immigration, uh, having the, the idea of other countries doing the plan that the affirmative team is advocating for. So what are some standards for these types of arguments? So real world, especially for 50 state and utopian, it's not really realistic to say all 50 states are going to take this one action unilaterally, or we're going to cause a communist revolution, and that'll happen the moment you vote neg, right? Those are not real world proposals, so maybe it's important to limit what types of fiat Action, fiated actions uh, we could take. Maybe our interpretation is you should only get realistic fiat. So, for example, the United States federal government taking a realistic policy that could happen uh, plausibly at some point in the future. Uh, there's the idea of reciprocity. If the affirmative team is bound by the resolution to only the United States federal government, why does the negative team get to advocate for a bunch of counterplans uh, or, yeah, counterplans or alternatives that don't involve the United States government? There's the idea of reciprocity there. Predictability. I mean, if you can run any plan whatsoever, who's to stop you from saying fiat world peace, especially like utopian fiat or in international fiat? There are hundreds and hundreds of nations in the world. Uh, how are we supposed to predict what nation or even combination of nations uh, is going to be your counter plan? And how are we supposed to prepare for that? Um, and then there's also debating yourself. So all of these plans, they take what the plan or the essence of the plan is, and all they do is change the actor. So then you're not debating, uh, you, you know, then you're debating your own plan. And the only thing the debate ends up being about is which actor is better. Um, and AF might argue that's pretty bad for education or that's pretty bad for fairness. Uh, the last thing I think we'll get to is the alphabet of spec. So there's a funny document from two years ago um, called the alphabet of spec, and spec really means specif specification, um, and it's basically 26 different letters, uh, so like A spec, B spec, C spec, yada yada, you get the point. Um, and basically it's just a bunch of theory arguments, some of them more true than others, 
um, that say you the the affirmative team didn't specify this in their plan. Uh, you should vote them down for X number of reasons. Uh, so the only one we're really going to talk about is A spec, which stands for actor specification. So two different interpretations. Uh, one app should specify the exact actor of their plan. So maybe you want the affirmative team to identify an agency or a department or maybe the attorney general or an individual in the government which is going to enact their plan. Or the affirmative should specify a branch of their plan. Uh, this is more of a well, this is a more hands-off approach where it's like, okay, you you didn't you just said USFG over and over again. Um, can you tell us Congress, the president, and the executive? or the courts, and if they don't tell you that, then maybe you run uh, this argument where it says they should only specify the branch as opposed to something extremely hyper-specific like the exact actor. So standards for a spec, which is the idea that the affirmative team needs to specify who carries out their plan when asked in cross-examination, uh, the idea behind this is that it would be unfair for the negative if the affirmative team didn't have to do that. Um, ground, so common arguments like courts counterplans, 50 state counterplans, all of these things that talk about the actor of a plan, um, those would be lost because the affirmative team can just say, oh wait, no, your courts counterplan isn't legitimate because we're part of the courts. We do our plan in the courts. And if they didn't say that when you asked them during cross-examination, well, suddenly that's a bit unfair and you're losing out on these core arguments, which might be important for debate. There's also topic education. Um, I mean, this is not really about the topic that the resolution specifies, but more about policy making itself. It might be uh, it, it might be more educational to say that the affirmative team should be able to tell us, um, prove that they've taken a civics course or have done their research and know how the government implements policies, uh, and that necessarily entails detailing the specific branches or specific actors within the government, uh, which will be necessary for carrying out uh, the plan. So we just went over a plethora of different theory arguments, and that certainly doesn't exhaust the giant list of theory arguments out there. So it may seem a bit daunting, um, especially considering there's so many standards to keep track of, so many different interpretations to keep track of, so many different arguments to keep track of. Um, but need not you have need not uh, no need to worry because debating theory is really all about methodology. So we'll start off when by talking about what a theory shell is. So this is sort of the argument you read in your 1NC. So in topicality arguments, it'd be the, the 1NC shell. In your theory arguments, it could be read at any point, um, technically, just as long as it's early enough in the debate that there will actually be a debate about it. So theory shells is basically the presentation, the initial presentation of a theory argument. So it's important to not get too tangled up in the weeds of every specific theory shell or every specific theory argument and just understand how theory as a broad concept really works because it all ultimately follows the same process. So the start of that process is theory shells. So here's how we write theory shells. So first, you're going to want to start with impacts, which are usually fairness and educational. What is it that you have a problem with? And why do you think it's it's unfair for you or it's uneducational for you? Um, and ask yourselves those questions because those questions will help you start to write theory shells and sort of, start, sort of understand arguments and where all of these standards and theory arguments actually came from in the first place. The second step is going to be to zero in on a couple of key arguments about what feels unfair or uneducational. So you've asked yourself, how is this uneducational? Now ask yourself, what about it is uneducational? So sort of zero in on what specific, what specifically makes something that the other team is doing uh, unfair or uneducational. Once you've got an idea of what those are, um, you can start to write out standards. So maybe come up with some terms that you can use uh, for each of the key arguments that we talked about in step two. Um, and then from those standards, give a basic explanation of how it leads to bad debate in one or more ways, uh, which is sort of tying back into the first part of this process, which is how the other team is being unfair or uneducational. The fourth thing is write an interpretation. So you've identified a problem that you have with the other team, so now you need a proposal for what could what they should be doing instead. What is the rules that they should be following that they aren't following? And then finally, you're going to want to write a thesis, uh, because a thesis, especially in lay debate, is important for helping your judges understand what's going on with this abstract theory argument. So you want to summarize your interpretation 
and key arguments. So that process is really important and getting a lot of practice with it will help you understand theory more and more. When I went to the Northwestern Debate Institute, one of the things I found that was best for helping me uh, understand theory was writing out my own theory shells, taking the hour, two hours, three hours, or even just 15 minutes uh, to think about a theory argument and think about how I would write uh, write this argument or debate this argument um, by myself or maybe with my debate partner um, and just work with theory. So um, the final thing is to write your standards and incorporate your impacts, of course, um, and we'll take a look at that now. So here's an example of something I wrote at the Northwestern Debate Institute. So we talked about conditionality, and one of the things we did was we actually had debates about conditionality good, conditionality bad. Um, so one of the things I had to do before in order to prepare for that debate is to do everything I just outlined in the last slide. Do these six steps and write out this type of interpretation. So let's take a look at it more closely. So conditionality is good. Here's the thesis. It mirrors real-world responses. Debate aims to mimic policymaking and advocacy will be met with multiple different responses from multiple individuals, many of which contradict. Advocates are forced to respond to each of those advocacies to explain how their policy balances the fine line. So what are the types of what can we really glean from this? So we have our interpretation here. Conditionality is good. Uh, then we have a bunch of key arguments. So it mimics real world. It mimics policymaking. Uh, An advocacy will be met with multiple different responses, um, many of which contradict. So here we see a summary of our key arguments and our interpretation. So that's our thesis. So the way I've structured this is I structured this into the two impacts. So first I looked at education and talked about some standards there. Then I looked at fairness and talked about some standards there. So you'll notice each of these is structured in a specific way. I start by naming my standard. Critical thinking. That's the name of my standard. Then I then I explain how this standard relates to my impact. So the app has to prove has to prove the plan is the best advocacy and why neg positions are worse even if they contradict. And that's good for education because now the affirmative team has to think uh, in more fluid or flexible ways. Um, so that might be uh, an example of a standard that I write for my conditionality shell. So you can read through the rest, uh, but basically I follow the six steps I outlined in the previous slide to write this theory argument and to get a cohesive theory argument which really um, ha has packs a lot of punch. So now let's talk about responding to theory arguments. So we know how to create and write a theory argument now, um, or after some practice we will, um, but it's also important to know what to do when you're faced with theory in the actual round. So first, you want to you wanna present a counterinterpretation. If they say conditionality good, you're going to want to say conditionality bad. Or if, you're, if, you, if they say states counterplan bad, you're going to want to say states counterplan good. You want a counterinterpretation always. And secondly, you want, you want to respond to your opponent's standards. So on the previous slide, I talked about some of the standards that I had, like critical thinking, or maybe uh, reciprocity, or maybe, uh, you know, real world. All of those things are reasons why they think that their rule of debate or their model of debate is way better than yours. Um, so you need to tell them wh why that's not true, because otherwise your judge is going to be like, oh, yeah, that makes total sense. So point out. Why are these standards not as bad as they make it out to be? Or why are their standards wrong? Or what is their counter, what does your counterinterpretation do to actually address those standards? Maybe conditionality is good um, and it forces critical thinking, but if we think conditionality is bad, it also forces critical thinking, uh, just maybe for the negative team instead of the affirmative team. Uh, third, you're going to want to attack your opponent's interpretation, so present your own voters for your counterinterpretation. Uh, so basically, write your own shell, present your own reasons why you think your interpretation is better. Uh, and finally, weigh impacts. Um, this is a bit more complicated, but it's like, how much does the... How much does each standard impact fairness or education? Uh, is fairness more important than education? Is education more fair and more important than fairness? Uh, all of these questions about uh, which which violations or which standards are the most egregious. And finally, you always want to make the argument reject the argument and not the team, because this is uh, this is basically the idea that um, like. If we reject the, if you think the theory argument is true and conditionality is bad, don't reject the team outright because that would be 
very that might be an extreme action. Maybe just only reject the counter plan. Um, and this is always an argument that you can go for um, when it comes to responding to theory. So now let's talk about how we debate theory in the 2NR and 2AR, because if one or both teams decides they want to go for a theory argument, uh, there's a special way to do it. And it's, you're going to see there's a lot of parallels to how we go for topicality in the 2NR. So first, if you're going to go for theory, whether you're the affirmative or whether you're the negative, uh, only go for it if you're losing on everything else and your opponents or your opponents also win for five minutes of theory. So if you're the 2NR, and uh, in the one AR, they spent five. They spent basically four minutes on theory and one minute on the case. Well, you're pretty aware. Uh, actually, this only applies for the two AR. So the two NR, if you, say your opponents in the one AR, they go for uh, one minute of case and four minutes of theory. You shall you shouldn't spend five minutes of theory because the thing is, you your speech can always be responded to. So if you go for uh, if if they're going for theory and they're the ones with the voters, um, you're going to want to make sure you at least spend ample time on theory so you don't lose on it, um, but enough time so that you can also win on everything else or cement that you're winning on everything else. Um, if you're the 2AR, uh, you should go for five minutes of theory because oftentimes what the negative team may do is they'll go for five minutes of theory in the 2NR. In that case, you need enough time so you can extend the case or extend your arguments but enough time so that you aren't losing on theory. So maybe like a four and a half, 30 second split. Or if you're the two in R, maybe like a four minute, one minute split. Secondly, if your opponents go for five minutes of theory, once again, take 15, 30 seconds, uh, reiterate this whole reject the argument, not the team. Um, because if your opponents go for theory, they only have one condition, one win condition. They win on theory and they win that it's so egregious that the judge has no option but to vote you down. Whereas you, you've got basically five minutes to go for theory, and you just need to prove that one, either you beat them on theory, or two, your violations aren't so egregious that they warrant rejecting you as a debater. They sh judge The judge shouldn't vote you down. Um, you also want to push your other arguments, so your case or your disadvantages, um, so that you have an alternative win condition. So your two win conditions would be first, um, well, your your two win conditions would be first, either you beat them on the theory level, or second, uh, the judge only rejects your argument and not the entirety of your team, and you have enough winning arguments in the other parts of the debate, such as the affirmative case, um, that you can win on everything else, because the negative team or the affirmative team, your opponents, they dropped everything else. And finally, you're going to want to do everything on the last slide to so do all that good debating stuff. Uh, present your counterinterpretation, reinforce your counterinterpretation, uh, rebut standards, do impact calc, reject the argument, not the team, all of, the, all of that stuff. That needs, to be, be, that needs to be done whether or not it's the uh, 2NC, the 1AR, the 1NR, the 2NR, the 2AR. All of that's just how to debate theory other than presenting the theory argument in the first place. And then finally, this is more for lay judges, but I think it's also important for every debate, especially theory debates, focus on world building. So what does the debate look like under your interpretation? Um, if we say it's conditionality good versus conditionality bad, what does a world of debate or what does a debate round look like with conditionality good and why is the debate round better? What does a world look like with conditionality bad? And why is the debate round better then? Or why is it worse then? Focus on world building because it's the 2NR and the 2AR. And for most judges, um, theory is such an abstract argument that it will be hard to conceptualize a lot of the things you're saying, especially if you're very technical um, without this whole world building stuff. So one thing I find um, in many of the most persuasive theory 2NRs or 2ARs is that they do make an attempt to show what debate and the debate space looks like if you vote for their team on the theory argument.